Shanders, thank you for that uh, introduction. It's a, a pleasure to be here. I've spent a lot of time in North Carolina. It's my first visit to Raleigh, so I'm really happy to be here. I've, I've been uh, the Outer Banks and Charlotte, Nashville, and a lot of other places. It's one of the most beautiful states in the country, and always, uh, always a pleasure to be here. It's been an interesting day. I had. Uh, breakfast in Montreal, uh, lunch in Toronto, looking forward to dinner uh, in Raleigh. Um, I apologize for being a couple minutes late. I thought I was in good good shape, but uh, I was coming on 40, I guess, and they, they closed the highway, like literally just closed the whole thing. Uh, there was a police car and a tow truck, and anyway, they, they eventually let us go, so sorry I was uh, a couple minutes late, but as I say, a, uh, a, a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank uh, uh, Seamus and uh, Janie and Kimberly and the rest of the uh, ICON team for uh, for inviting me. Uh, thank you all for uh, for turning out. So um, our our topic is the future of the international monetary system. Now I could spend a long time on the past and the history and and current uh, situation, and that's all important. But uh, I want to lean forward a little bit, take uh, some of what Seamus mentioned in terms of what has happened. Uh, certainly in the last 10 years, but going back even further, uh, which I do cover in my books, and um, look at where we're going, because that's going to affect you. It's going to affect your investments, your retirement, um, whether it's health care, children's education, uh, whatever goals you have in mind are all dependent on your savings, the wealth you've accumulated, your investment, et cetera. And all of that is in play. Whenever there's a financial crisis, you don't know exactly where it's going to end up, but there are a set of scenarios, and we get closer to them all the time, where um, a lot of that could be at risk, and we're going to talk about that. But also uh, spend most of the lecture on a, a new subject, because this really is fairly new, uh, which is financial warfare. So your risks are not only um, you know, financial panic or a crash or the kinds of things we've all lived through, whether it was 2008 or the 2000 dot-com crash or the 1998 Russia long-term capital management collapse, 1994 in Mexico, 1987, stock market fell 22% in one day, October 19, 1987. 22% today uh, would be about uh, 5,000 points on the Dow Jones. So you know if it goes down 500 points, that's all you hear about in the headlines. Imagine going down 5,000 points in one day. Well, that, the equivalent percentage terms is what happened on October 19th, uh, 1987. So we've all seen the litany of financial crises, but uh, the point I want to make tonight is that there are new threats, new <coughs> actors on the landscape, which, are, which is actually financial warfare using currencies, stocks, bonds, derivatives, commodities, foreign exchange, et cetera, as weapons of war instead of, um, you know, I say to people, I do a lot of, uh, I've lectured recently at the U.S. Army War College uh, and the uh, U.S. Naval Base in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, to one of the joint operating commands. And I say, you know, why do you send, why do you send missiles and bombers and um, you know, various forms of attack and infantry, et cetera, to attack an enemy? Well, they say, well, we want to you know, degrade their capabilities, destroy their infrastructure, uh, take out their oil pipelines, their ports, et cetera. That's what you do in a war. So what if you could, all, what if you could do all that with a flick of a switch? What if you could do it all by hacking into their financial system, shutting down the stock exchange, shutting down their banks, freezing accounts? You would, you would achieve the same thing. You would degrade the financial capability of your opponent, but you wouldn't have to fire a shot. That's the world we live in today. Unfortunately, all of us, me and, and all of you, can be collateral damage when that uh, starts to get out of control. So uh, we'll, t we'll talk a little bit um, about that as well. Uh, so let me, uh, let me jump ahead, make, make a quick point that um, Economic warfare, or financial warfare, if you want to be more precise, is not completely new. There are a lot of new things about it that I'm going to talk about, uh, but it's actually been a part of warfare uh, as far back as you want to go. And uh, uh, I don't know how many people have read War and Peace, uh, um, is a story of uh, the battle between Napoleon and, uh, and the Russians. But um, why did, uh, why did uh, Napoleon invade Russia in the first place? Uh, you know, War and Peace is a great novel. Well, the British, the Royal Navy, in a war, had created a blockade of continental Europe. So France could not trade with, uh, whether it was the West Indies or North America, South America, or any of its other trading partners. Uh, and they were starting to feel the pinch. And Napoleon said, well, look, I've pretty much conquered Europe, or most of Europe. Uh, we have a lot of countries here. We have diverse uh, inputs and manufacturing, artisanal skills, agriculture, et cetera. He created what he called the continental system. And he said, we don't have to trade with the rest of the world. We can trade with each other and get around this uh, Royal Navy blockade. But he had two uh, countries that didn't go along with the plan. One was Spain, 
the other was Russia. So he invaded both of them to enforce his economic plan. Uh, so there's a, there's a case where uh, it wasn't just you know for the fun of it or because he was an egomaniac, although I guess he was, uh, but he actually wanted to enforce this economic plan that I described. Uh, of course, the Russia invasion ended disastrously, but it had an economic motive behind it. In um, the 1830s and 1850s, uh, Britain fought two opium wars with China. Uh, probably, I'm sure everyone's heard about that, where they actually sent the Royal Navy again into Hong Kong, blasted their way into the, the port, and forced the Chinese to accept uh, opium, which was being exported by the UK uh, to China. Of course, the, the Xing Dynasty wanted no part of it. That's not good for anybody. Uh, they told uh, the UK they would not trade it or accept it, and the UK forced them to. Uh, well, that's what the Opium Wars were all about. But what was behind that? Why was the UK doing that? Did they just want a, uh, a country of drug addicts? Well, well, no. At the time, countries were on what's called the mercantilist system, where you, everybody's supposed to have a, a balance of trade surplus. Now, mathematically, that's impossible. Somebody's got to have a deficit if somebody else has a surplus, but you don't worry about that. You just say, we want a surplus. And at the time, it was on a gold standard, or silver was a monetary metal. So if you had a trade surplus, you got paid in gold and silver, and you piled up the gold and silver, and that was the source of national wealth. And then you could use it uh, to finance a war if you had to. Well, um, uh, the, the British tried to uh, engage in trade with China, and China said, you don't really have anything we want. Now, the British wanted a lot from China. They wanted tea and silk and manufactured goods and various inventions and uh, agricultural goods. Uh, but the Chinese didn't want anything from the British. Maybe they were arrogant, maybe they were just uh, felt culturally superior. Uh, so the UK was running a trade deficit with China and a lot of silver, the Chinese actually preferred silver. A lot of silver was going from the UK to China and on Whitehall Street in London, they just said, well, we, we can't have this. We have, what do we have that they want? What do we have that they need? And somebody said, well, we've got heroin because um, the UK controlled uh, Afghanistan and uh, India and a few other places that produced the poppies. And so they got the Chinese hooked on opium and that balanced the trade. But uh, if, that, if that sounds familiar, think about what President Trump is doing today with China. Uh, you have all these uh, economists going into the White House saying, yeah, Mr. President, don't you understand that a trade deficit is okay because that means we get capital inflows, et cetera. I'll spare you all the details of that argument. And Trump says, I don't care. I want this trade deficit down. And right now it's about $500 billion a year with China. We're in deficit, they're in surplus. He wants it down to about $200 billion. There are ways to do that. China could just buy more soybeans from us. Um, and then people say, well, wait a second, we buy soybeans from Brazil and Canada, and Trump says, too bad, this is America first, buy them from us and let the Canadians figure it out. And that's, that's, how, uh, that's how these trade programs work. But the point is the president is completely focused on the surplus or the deficit, reducing the deficit, independent of any other academic arguments that say it doesn't matter. Well, it's exactly the position the British were in 160 years ago. And uh, we see how they solved it. So it also shows that there's kind of nothing new under the sun. But the opium wars were completely economically driven, having to do with the UK's trade deficit with, U with uh, China. Uh, the last example I'll mention is uh, Pearl Harbor. We all remember, if we don't remember, uh, have certainly been taught and learned and uh, internalized December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. But less well known is the fact that on July 24th, 1941, uh, about six months before the attack, President Roosevelt, FDR, froze all Japanese assets in U.S. banks. Uh, so any Japanese companies or individuals or the state itself with assets in U.S. banks, those accounts were frozen. Uh, a few months later, in August 1941, the U.S. imposed an oil, bar oil embargo on Japan. Obviously, Japan doesn't have any oil, and if you don't have oil, you can't run your navy. Um, and then on December 7, 1941, um, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. I'm not saying that was direct cause and effect, but I do think it's important to understand that the U.S. had, in effect, declared financial war on Japan before Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. So, yeah, Pearl Harbor was, uh, uh, was the start of the war, but uh, there was a lot of financial warfare going on before that. So the point is that there's nothing completely new about financial warfare. but. All three of these examples I've given you are financial warfare tactics, economic warfare tactics, in conjunction with kinetic warfare. So Napoleon had to actually invade Russia. He couldn't put on sanctions. And the British actually had to invade, blast their way into Hong Kong. And the Japanese actually had to attack 
Pearl Harbor. So uh, the, the economic and what's called the kinetic, just you know, things that shoot and explode, uh, went hand in hand. Uh, today we're in what I call a new age of financial warfare. You can actually have a financial war without any kinetic activity at all. Uh, you can bankrupt a country, you can engineer regime change. Um, I've been involved in a few efforts along those lines. Um, so I say my definition, degrade and defeat the capabilities of adversaries by non-kinetic means. Not shooting, not invading, not firing missiles, using sanctions, capital markets, banking systems, exchanges, clearing houses, payments, channels for cash, stocks, bonds, deposits, etc. These are your weapons of war. Of course, they're financial instruments. Of course, they're how we save and invest. But they can also be used to destabilize uh, countries. And they are being used. And we'll point out some examples. Now, I'm not going to go through everything on this list in detail. Each one of these line items, I could do a two-hour lecture on. So we're not going to uh, put anyone through that. But I want to make the point that there is a long list of statutes and regulations that empower the president to engage in financial warfare or to protect the national security of the United States. Uh, the first one, it's got a clunky name, International Emergency Economic Powers Act of 1977, called IEPA for short. This was enacted during the administration of uh, President Carter. Um, this actually gives the president dictatorial powers when national security is at stake. And that's not an exaggeration. By the way, in the Roman Republic, they had an office called dictator, and, and it wasn't a bad guy. It was, uh, it was an emergency empowerment of the leader. So normally you had um, a, you know, a council or uh, other figures of the Roman Republic, later the Roman Empire, who were elected. It wasn't you know, uh, widespread uh, 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 voter empowerment. It was only an elite that was allowed to vote. But it, it, had, it was a Republican form of government. There were elections, and people got chosen for these offices. But if they were being invaded, if they were at war, if there was an economic crisis, they had the Senate had the power to appoint a dictator. It was a two-year term, but you just had extraordinary powers. You, you, would, you could do whatever you wanted. <coughs> Pardon me. We have the same law today, and this, this is it, uh, AIPA. And um, when you read the postmortems on the 2008 financial crisis, you'll hear Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson, who was Secretary of the Treasury, repeat ad nauseum, well, we really wanted to save Lehman Brothers, we didn't want it to go bankrupt, but we didn't have the statutory authority to do it. Nonsense. They did. Either their lawyers didn't tell them, or their lawyers were incompetent, which I doubt. I'm sure the lawyers knew all, uh, all about this. Or they chose not to do it, which is okay, but don't blame it on the law. You have to take responsibility for your decision. But this law would have allowed the United States government to nationalize Lehman Brothers uh, at the time because the national security was at risk because the world was uh, in the midst of a major financial collapse. Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917, this is how we got Bayer Aspirin, uh, Bayer AG, the biggest German chemical company. They had a, a subsidiary in the United States. President Wilson just confiscated it during World War I under the Trading with the Enemy Act. <coughs> um, interesting uh, footnote, in 1933, Within weeks of taking office, President Roosevelt issued an executive order confiscating all the gold in the United States, all the privately held gold in the United States. He made gold contraband. You had to hand it in to the Treasury. They gave you $20 an ounce. That's, that was the price at the time. But Roosevelt knew that he was going to raise it to $35 an ounce. So he wanted to capture the profit. This is like insider trading. So I'll give you 20 bucks an ounce for your gold, but I'm going to raise the price to 35 because I'm the president. And he did. And um, it wasn't really about raising the price of gold. That's the way it's presented. It was really about devaluing the dollar. Another way to think about it, gold used to be um, a dollar would get you 1 20th of an ounce of gold. And when FDR was done, it would get you 1 35th of an ounce of gold. So it was really a devaluation of the dollar. And Roosevelt wanted that because he wanted inflation because we were in the middle of the Great Depression and we were in the throes of deflation. And they couldn't find a way to get prices to go up. And Roosevelt said, I know how, I'll just, I'll devalue the dollar against gold, and then everything else went up. And that's what happened. We got inflation in 1933, 34 turned out to be a really good year for the stock market, right in the middle of the Great Depression. Well, what statutory authority did President Roosevelt use to issue that executive order? He can't just do it for fun. He used the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917. Now, I don't know who the enemy was. It was probably us, like the American people. But, um, but that's what he used. Anyway, the, there's a long list here. The, the one, the skipping one, uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, CFIUS, 
Uh, I did a lot of work for the intelligence community over many years in CFIUS. When you say CFIUS, people say, does it uh, itch or burn? Uh, but it is, uh, it's, it's an acronym for this committee. This is an interagency committee composed of uh, cabinet officers or their deputies that can reject foreign acquisitions of U.S. companies on national security uh, grounds. So if Russia or China want to buy a U.S. tech company, the U.S. government can just say no. And this is how they do it with, uh, with CFIUS. Now, when I was doing it, um, mostly during the Obama administration, the government really leaned over backwards to let deals go forward. I mean, we would, I was working with the CIA, and we, we did the intelligence. We didn't have any decision-making authority. It was our job to point out the threats. Like, oh, the People's Liberation Army controls Huawei, which is the largest Chinese uh, telecommunications company. But we would report on the threats, but it was up to the Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Commerce, and a few others as to whether the deals were going to go through. And they would more often than not come back and say, look, can we mitigate this? Can we let the deal go through? We have what they call a mitigation agreement that says the Chinese guy can't be on the board of directors or he can't, et cetera. And, we, and they'd find ways to do that. The Trump administration has weaponized CFIUS. Today, no means no. And they are completely blocking all Chinese acquisitions, practically all, of uh, U.S. Uh, technology companies, communications companies. I guess if the Chinese want to buy Ben & Jerry's ice cream, that might be okay. But they can forget about uh, you know, Qualcomm or uh, Broadcom or uh, you know, certainly any companies larger than that in the technology space. Um, and Trump has uh, interpreted this very broadly and applied it to other countries other than China. So I would say we have now weaponized CFIUS. Anyway, long you, you know, Patriot Act you're familiar with, SWIFT, uh, Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications. Um, you all know like sort of where the brain meets the spinal cord. That's a really sensitive part of the human neuro system. SWIFT is the brain and the spinal cord of the international financial system. SWIFT is a message traffic provider where all the major transactions between all the major banks in the world are processed. Uh, if there's a central nervous system for the global banking system, it's SWIFT. It's based in Belgium, um, and when Deutsche Bank sends $5 billion to Citibank, or Bank of America sends $10 billion to Banco Santander, it all goes through SWIFT. If you think of it as a choke point, it's the Straits of Hormuz. You know, half the world's oil goes through the Straits of Hormuz. Far more than half the world's financial transactions go through SWIFT. If you cut off that choke point, you're going to have serious consequences. I'll come back to that because we're using this uh, today uh, against Iran. So again, I'll, I'll skip over the rest. Um, but, but my point is, when you have a financial crisis or a financial confrontation or you're in a financial war, the White House does not have to run to Congress and say, please, please give me some powers. The president has these powers. And Trump has shown more willingness to use them than any president, well, probably ever, uh, but you know, some have used it more than others, but Trump's using it extensively, so he's, he has weaponized these uh, financial tools. A um, couple points about financial warfare in the 21st century, just to distinguish it from the, uh, the 19th century examples I gave, or 20th century examples. Um, and I mentioned this already, financial war can be completely non-kinetic. In other words, you can fight a whole war through the financial system without firing a shot, and it can be just as devastating to the wealth of your adversary. Um, cyber financial warfare is what the military calls a force multiplier. A force multiplier is you've got you know, a main body or you know, whatever. It's an infantry division, it's a, a, an a aircraft carrier task force, or whatever it is. But you bring something else into play that makes it twice as strong or twice as effective, whether that's uh, you know, an amphibious landing or you can cut off telecommunications. These things uh, are called force multipliers because they make your force even stronger. Uh, financial warfare can be a force multiplier, or it can be used um, in conjunction with other events that are going on. So if you're China and you want to launch a financial attack on the United States, are you going to do it on a day when the Dow Jones is up 800 points or a day when it's down 800 points? Because sometimes it goes down 800 points on its own. Obviously, the Chinese are going to wait for a day when things are bad already on its own and launch the attack then and there's your force multiplier because you're piling on an already weak and vulnerable system and you're destroying confidence. Um, and then the final point I make is that financial warfare can be decisive. It's no longer just an add-on or a collateral feature of a kinetic war. You can actually destabilize countries, achieve regime change, shut down governments you don't like, and again, I'll, I'll return to that. So, um, 
Here's uh, something I, pr I put together for the Army. I said, man, Army, uh, uh, the, uh, my lecture at the U.S. Army War College was something called the Advanced Strategic Arts Program. And these were hand-picked mid-career officers. So they were majors, lieutenant colonels, uh, one or two generals, but as I say, most, mostly majors and colonels, um, and some civilians, people from the CIA, um, and some other agencies, Defense Intelligence Agency and others. And they've been hand-picked because they're going to be the future chief strategists of the military. So I'm sure they all have some uh, heroic uh, fighting activity in their backgrounds, but their careers from now on are going to be, to be, in effect, be a Henry Kissinger type strategist. So uh, a lot of big brains in the room, and, and I thought, well, other than analysis and headlines and statutes, I, I need to give them a theoretical framework so we can think about this uh, financial warfare in relation to all other economic activities, because most economic activities are not warfare, it's just economic competition. So I created the spectrum from uh, ultraviolet violet to infrared. So over on the, uh, the left side of your screen are what I would call normal commercial activities. So, you know, Alibaba competes against Google or Ford competes against Volkswagen. It's normal trade, normal commerce, normal uh, innovation. Uh, the next one, a little, over, uh, a little more over in the blue area, now you get into cheating. So it's still economic uh, competition as opposed to warfare. Uh, but you're dumping excess capacity, you're, um, you're manipulating your currency, uh, you're uh, stealing intellectual property. So you're, you're breaking the rules. It can still be labeled as economic competition, as I say. China is the biggest rule breaker on the planet. Um, I say if you want to understand how China negotiates and, and how they operate, uh, think of an exclusive club that has a uh, you know, limited membership list and a dress code. So you have to wear a jacket and a tie for dinner and China's applying for membership, and you sit down with the membership committee, and they say, well, you do, you do understand that you have to wear a jacket and tie for dinner, and they go, yes, we do. Uh, and then they get into the club, and they show up in cutoffs and flip-flops and a t-shirt. And then, what are you gonna do, kick them out? So, and this is how China, they promise and promise, and they get into the World Trade Organization, they get into the IMF SDR basket, and they immediately break the rules, but they're too big to kick out so, um, so what do you do? Well, you don't trust them going forward, and that's the attitude that President Trump has taken. So then over uh, in the middle, the green, now we're getting a little more aggressive. These are uh, tariffs, trade sanctions, weaponized CFIUS. When the United States tells Huawei, the big Chinese telecommunications company, that they're not allowed to buy Qualcomm, is that trade or is that warfare? Well, you're getting closer to warfare, that's the point. Uh, and again, no shots are being fired, but that's more closer to that part of the spectrum. Uh, out in the yellow, I've got uh, de-swifting. Uh, de-swifting is one of those words you only hear in Washington. Uh, but what it means is I just kicked you out of SWIFT. Uh, that's like going into intensive care, finding a patient who needs the oxygen, turning off the oxygen. Not gonna last too long. You cut off access to SWIFT, you cannot get hard currency in and out of your banking system doesn't matter if it's dollars, euros, yen, Swiss francs, uh, pounds sterling, you cannot transfer that money to your banking system because that SWIFT is how you do it. Um, and again, that, that's a kind of a strangulation technique. And then out on the right, um, this is clearly warfare, malicious cyber attacks and critical infrastructure, um, taking over order entry systems. Um, one, um, when I first started doing this about 10 years ago, we warned that you know, the Chinese had so much money, they could actually fund hedge funds around the world uh, and give them each, you know, a billion dollars of capital, which is a fairly large hedge fund. China certainly has the money. <coughs> and they could open up shop in Macau or Cayman Islands or British Virgin Islands, the usual places, and just start trading completely legitimately. They would just buy and sell stocks and buy and sell bonds and look like any other hedge fund. They would. The brokers would take them out to dinner, they would ingratiate themselves into the system, they would be trusted, uh, they would get more capital, more relationships, and then one day, on a signal from Beijing in a coordinated way, they would massively flood the market with sell orders, you know, sell Apple, sell Google, sell Netflix, sell every stock you own, <coughs> pardon me, and, um, and sink the market. And that was a real threat, and there were steps taken to look out for that. But where we are today, you actually don't need any money, and you don't need a hedge fund. What you do need are really good hackers. And um, so what you do 
you get into the, say, uh, I like Morgan Stanley, so I'll pick on them, uh, the Morgan Stanley order entry system, actually get into their computers and flood the New York Stock Exchange with the same sell orders I just talked about, you know, Apple, Google, all the big names, sink the market, do the same thing to the bond market, um, you know, other commodities, et cetera. But you haven't actually got any money and you're not actually trading, you've just captured someone else's order entry system who is trusted and big and you're flooding the market with all these orders. Um, and I say things like this and some people roll their eyes and they're like, oh, that would never happen. Actually, Morgan Stanley told me it would never happen, but uh, it, it has happened. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a company called Night Trading. Uh, they had an automated trading system. Uh, something went awry. Uh, was it hacked? Not clear, but something went wrong. And this company started putting in all these sell orders uh, on the New York Stock Exchange, taking the market down. Nobody could find the kill switch. They were running around uh, the company saying, oh, turn it off, turn it off. Nobody could find the person who knew how to turn it off. And they lost uh, $450 million in about three hours and almost put the firm out of business. So it actually has happened. Uh, but whether that could be done in a bigger way, a more malicious way, um, I'm sure the answer is yes. That's an act of war. We're not, the red zone, is, we're, not, we're not debating it anymore. This is uh, pure financial warfare. Um, a couple of financial wars going on around the world today. Iran, we're, in, we're actually in the second US, financial, US Iranian financial war. The first one ran from uh, 2011 through 2016. Now in 2011, the United States kicked Iran out of what's called Fedwire. That's the US payment system. So I said SWIFT is the international payment system, but there's something called Fedwire where all, all U.S. dollar transactions and purchases and sales of U.S. Treasury securities uh, go. It's run by the Treasury and the Federal Reserve. You know, the last paper Treasury certificate, I don't know if anyone has one in their attic, but the last one was issued around 1981. Uh, ever since then, it's been completely digital. Uh, and that, that ledger is, as I say, uh, operated by the Treasury. So um, we kicked Iran out, so no more dollars. Uh, so if you're shipping oil and you're getting paid in dollars, those dollars cannot go to an Iranian bank account, and any foreign bank that helps them do that is going to be fined itself. And there were actually hundreds of billions of dollars of fines imposed on HSBC, um, JP Morgan, UBS, and other major international banks for violating these rules. So they got the message. Um, well, Iran said, ah, who cares? We'll sell our oil for euros, and we'll get the euros through SWIFT. We don't need your dollar payment system. Well, the U.S. prevailed on its allies in SWIFT, including the fact that, at least today, the chairman of SWIFT is um, a senior officer of J.P. Morgan, so our, the U.S. banks have a big role in this, and we got them kicked out of SWIFT. That's called de-SWIFTing. That's serious, because now they can't get any of the hard currencies. They could ship oil to India and get paid rupees in an Indian bank account, you don't need SWIFT for that, but what are you gonna do with the rupees? I mean, how much curry do the uh, Iranians need? So um, th this was a real uh, dead end for them, and uh, it forced them to the table. It did what uh, President Obama wanted. It forced the Iranians to come to the table uh, and start negotiating their nuclear development program, which was the whole point of this financial war. And I've met with the Treasury officials who, uh, who made that decision, I, I personally I would have doubled down. We were halfway to regime change without firing a shot. As I mentioned, I would have tightened those sanctions, but the, we kind of let them off the mat. Two years of negotiations, 2015, uh, the um, uh, joint uh, uh, program, the joint memorandum uh, plan of action uh, uh, on the end of the Iranian nuclear program. Um, so that's that. Trump gets in, says he hates the program, gives the Iranians a year to make concessions. They don't make the concessions. He tears it up. Uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA. Trump tears it up, puts the sanctions back on, what he calls maximum pressure. So we are today back to where we were in uh, 2012. We've already, for, they don't have any assets in the US banking system. They, they figure that out. Uh, but if there were any, they'd be frozen. They're out of the dollar payment system. And we're now leaning on SWIFT to de-SWIFT Iran for the second time. We'll see how that turns out. Um, we, we may know more literally in a matter of weeks, but we're back at war with the uh, financial war with Iran. Putin, um, uh, there, everyone says, well, he's the bad guy because he invaded Crimea, took it over, and interfered in eastern Ukraine, and interfered with the U.S. elections in 2016. All those things are true. Nobody asks why he did it. 
He did it because in February 2014, CIA and MI6 interfered in the Ukrainian electoral process. He had reached a modus vivendi with a sort of a pro-Putin president of Ukraine. Um, we decided we didn't like that person. We wanted to peel them off, bring them into NATO, uh, stirred up a little uh, street demonstrations. Next thing you know, the, the, pres the president of Ukraine's on his way to Moscow, and we got somebody in that we like better. And then Putin said, well, two can play. So uh, I'm not defending Putin. He's a bad guy. He's a, he's a thug and a killer. But he's also uh, almost at the grandmaster level as a chess player. He's a judo expert. And he, and he was a, a long career with the KGB and lived in Germany. So knows, he knows he's a very sharp, smart player, knows exactly what he's doing. And everything they've done to us is retaliation for what we did to him. And now we're imposing sanctions on Russia. So this is going back and forth and it's escalating. So we're in another war with, uh, with Russia, including uh, uh, tariffs uh, prohibiting major Russian corporations from refinancing their bonds in Europe uh, and, and many other things. And again, as I say, it is escalating. It's ironic because uh, we're also in a financial war with China. Um, there are only three countries in the world that really matter, uh, Russia, China, and the United States based on size, nuclear arsenals, economic power, control of natural resources, computing, hacking, capability, and a lot of other things. Uh, I can go down a long list. Where people got the idea that Russia is some kind of third-rate, messed up emerging market, I have no idea. It's not. It's a superpower and was throughout the Cold War and still is. Uh, it's got its problems. All these countries have their problems. But three countries matter, US, China, and Russia. Sorry about everyone else. You're secondary or tertiary. Um, well, I don't know if anyone here plays poker, but uh, you know the first thing you learn in poker, if you're in a three-handed poker game and you don't know who the sucker is, you're the sucker. In other words, the way, the way you win those games is two people pile up on the third guy, clean them out, and then they duke it out with each other. Um, and U.S. foreign policy has always been based on the idea that Russia and China could not be better friends with each other than one of them was with us. Didn't mean we had to like each other, all be in uh, you know kumbaya land, but you had to have good relations with Russia and good relations with China if you could, and those relations had to be stronger than the Russian-Chinese relation. And that was drive a wedge between your two opponents. Um, that was why Trump was reaching out to Russia in the transition uh, after he was elected, before he was sworn in, because he understood. And, he, and Trump was getting his advice from Kissinger. Kissinger's 94, he's still pretty sharp. Um, and Kissinger was saying, you know, Mr. President, we, we're, gonna, we're in a war with China, so we better get Russia on our side if we can. And then that just kind of turned into this whole Russiagate thing. I, I, I'll leave that uh, for another day. But, um, but Trump is trying to forge a relationship with Putin, notwithstanding all the problems I just described. And the third one is our friend uh, Kim Jong-un. We'll see where these negotiations go. Obviously, negotiations are better than war, but we are using what we call maximum pressure on North Korea, major economic sanctions. Um, <clears throat> on top of these financial wars, we have trade wars. Um, and they usually go hand in hand. This happened in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, here's the, the troika of trade warriors. Uh, on your left, uh, Robert Lighthizer. In the middle, middle Wilbur Ross, uh, Secretary of Commerce. Uh, and over on your, um, your right, uh, Peter Navarro, who's the President's uh, trade advisor. Of the three, Lighthizer is by far the most important. I'm not saying the other two don't have a voice. Of course they do. But Lighthizer is the big brain. Lighthizer has been doing this since the Reagan administration. Uh, Ross doesn't have that big a say. Navarro is the guy they put on TV. So when you see something on TV, it's Peter Navarro. But when you're in the Oval Office, it's Lighthizer um, advising the president. <laughs> Lighthizer in the Reagan administration at a time when the Japanese were completely taking over the US auto industry and Detroit was collapsing, uh, basically put quotas on Japanese cars. He, he put tariffs on, chi on Japanese goods as a way to get them to negotiate, and then imposed uh, tariffs on Japanese cars. And the Japanese said, we'll jump the tariff barrier and put our plants in the United States. And Lighthizer and Reagan said, thank you very much. That's what we wanted, because we wanted those jobs. Uh, and where are, they, where are they today? They're in North Carolina. They're in South Carolina. They're in Mississippi, Tennessee. Um, they're all over the asset, creating hundreds of thousands of very good high-paying jobs with benefits. That's what we got by playing tough with the Japanese. Lighthizer is now running the same playbook with China. Uh, a good reason to know that he's 
practically uncompromising. He's not your typical Washington bureaucrat who's going to roll over. So beginning last January, you can see this coming a, a, a long ways away, but beginning last January, I started advising clients and writing you know, op-eds or doing things in, in speeches like this saying, this trade war is serious, it's going to escalate, it's going to be around for a long time, and it's going to have a major economic impact. And everybody on Wall Street laughs, you go, oh no, it's the art of the deal, Trump's posturing, the Chinese don't want to lose face, they'll figure it out. No. They may figure it out eventually, but it might be five years from now and there'll be a lot of damage done in the meantime. So, so they put the trade wars on top of everything else we're discussing to see what a fragile environment we're in. Cyber financial warfare, I won't spend a lot of time on that. I'm sure you've heard quite a bit about it, but I've given a few examples already where if you can hack into these systems, you can imitate the banks, imitate the traders, and cause major market disruption. Now, I talked a lot about the U.S. financial weapons. Um, the uh, IEPA gives the president dictatorial powers, freezing the accounts, trading with the Enemy Act, CFIUS, and all the other uh, weapons in our financial warfare arsenal. Um, the other countries in the world are getting a little sick of this. They, we, we implement our sanctions through the dollar, through our control of the payment system. The U.S. dollar is uh, over 60% of global reserves, it's over 80% of global payments, and it's almost 100% of the global oil market. So you don't get very far without the dollar, having the dollars, having access to the dollar payment system, et cetera. And we've been throwing our weight around, and it's been pretty effective. But a lot of countries are getting fed up, and so they're beginning to take steps to uh, push back. The first one, uh, here I have a, a China, Russia, Iran, and Turkey. They've created what I call the new access of gold. They're just getting all the gold they can as fast as they can. Russia has tripled its reserves in the past 10 years. China has more than tripled its reserves in the past 10 years. Iran, we don't know because they're not transparent, but they might have 100 tons of gold, which is quite a bit of gold, and Turkey's doing likewise. Um, I read this morning that Hungary has increased its gold reserves 1,000%. Hungary's in Europe, it's not, it's not Asia, it's not usually considered an enemy. Hungary has taken their gold reserves from 30 tons to 300 tons. Poland bought some gold. Poland's a member of the EU. Why are EU members buying gold? Well, obviously they see it as the money of the future. They see it as a hedge against financial catastrophe and inflation. So, so that's what's going on. So whenever I look at the, the Russians, they took the reserves from 600 tons to 2,000 tons. By the way, there are only 33,000 tons of official gold in the world. That's it. When I say official gold, this is gold owned by central banks, finance ministries, sovereign wealth funds, and not personal gold, but official gold, 33,000 tons, uh, and the Russians now have 2,000 tons. That's a lot, that's all, you know, almost 10% of all the official gold in the world, so, um, or about seven or eight percent, but my, my point being, you have to ask yourself, are the Russians stupid, or do they see something coming that most people don't? Well, I've been to Russia, I've been to Moscow, I have Russian friends, I study them closely. They're not stupid. So clearly they're getting out ahead of the curve and the Chinese are doing likewise. This is just food for thought in terms of where the system is going. Uh, this graph, this is, shows the percentage of total reserves composed of gold for these three countries. The top country is Russia. Uh, they're almost 20% of their total reserves. Uh, and the red line is um, China, oh, sorry, Turkey which has moved up to above 10%. China, you can see the increase. Uh, it's still a very small percentage. It's only about 2%, but that's because China's reserves are so large. Uh, China has $3 trillion in reserves. So they have, it's not clear, they're not completely transparent. Perhaps, officially they say 2,000 tons. Uh, it wouldn't be a stretch to say they maybe have three or 4,000 tons. The rest of it's not disclosed. That's a lot of gold. That's almost half as much gold as the United States. But because the reserves are so large, the percentage um, is, is fairly small. But I think Russia is the, uh, the one breaking away. And again, I could add to this with uh, Poland, Hungary, and Mexico, Kazakhstan, Vietnam. All the countries I just mentioned are, are acquiring gold. Uh, as I mentioned, Iran may have as much as 100, 100 tons of gold. Um, President Obama gave Iran 10 billion dollars in cash and gold in 2014-2015, part of the, out of a hundred billion dollars of total compensation. This was partly to get the hostages released, partly as part of this, uh, uh, this uh, JCPOA on the Iranian nuclear program, etc. 
By the way, when I say, ca when I say cash, I mean cash. They gave them bills. Uh, Iran didn't want anything that went through the payment system because they knew the U.S. could take it back. And we didn't want to give them dollars, so we gave them euros. And so the United States Treasury had to go to the Central Bank of the Netherlands and say, uh, hey guys, you got, uh, you got $10 billion of cash lying around. They did. They, they put it on pallets and they flew it to Iran. Iran <laughs> promptly used it to support terrorism in Yemen, Sinai, uh, Gaza, uh, Lebanon, uh, Hezbollah, Syria, you name it. Um, so uh, so we, uh, we financed all that, but Iran's in a relatively strong position. But having said that, they are suffering from the second U.S.-Iranian financial war that I talked about, where they got it, they wasted most of it on terrorism, uh, and they can't get more because we're cutting them off. November 4th is a big day. I know everyone's focused on November 6th, which is Election Day, but November 4th is the day this U.S. sanctions on Iran go into force. Watch what happens, because they're not going to be able to sell a drop of oil. Um, well, we better hope Saudi Arabia comes through. Um, so, uh, so here, here are the official gold holdings, and I put this up just for a very simple reason. You can see that through uh, 2007, I think that is, they were going down. And by the way, the, the blue are the developed economies, and this, this truncates, this starts at 24,000 tons. So there's a lot of blue under the line, I just want to make that clear. But the developed economies, the blue economies, have not been increasing their gold reserves at all for 10 years. So they're just kind of flat along the bottom. All the increases in the emerging markets, mostly Russia and China. So again, don't, you know, whether people have gold, don't have gold, that's a personal decision. I'm not here to tell you what to do. But don't let anybody tell you that gold is not a growing part of the international monetary system because you wouldn't have this kind of increase if it wasn't. Um, just make the point that the dollar is declining. Uh, I said it's 60% uh, of, of global reserves, which it is, but that's down from 66% um, uh, uh, just five years ago. So uh, down is down. Um, I do think, there's no magic in this, but I do think when you get closer to 50%, that's a critical threshold. That's the point at which all of a sudden the world may wake up and say, hey, dollar's just another currency along with euros and Swiss francs and, uh, and gold and the other things we've been, uh, we've been mentioning. So dollar is declining as a percentage of total reserves. Gold is going up. I just showed you that in the last chart. <coughs> so here's a, here's a preview of the future. When I say the future, everything on the slide is already in development or working. So this is not science fiction. This is not something for the 22nd century. It's happening now. Um, basically, China and Russia are building their own cryptocurrency system. Now, when I say cryptocurrency, don't go out and buy Bitcoin. I, I don't like Bitcoin. I think it's the worst thing you could do. Uh, but, they, but the world of cryptocurrencies is not limited to Bitcoin. There are actually over 2,000 cryptocurrencies, some of them quite small. But you could invent, you could come tonight with the right software, you could invent your own cryptocurrency called the, uh, the Icon Coin. Um, but, uh, but Russia and China are developing their own. Uh, what used to be called the blockchain, uh, today people call it the distributed ledger. So this is distributed ledger technology. Uh, they're developing their own coin or token. It'll be heavily encrypted, military-grade encryption, uh, with their own pipes, meaning their own kind of private internet. And imagine an economy that looks like the following. So Iran um, sells oil to China. North Korea sells weapons to Iran. China sells infrastructure to Russia. Russia sells weapons to China. Russians take a vacation in Turkey because it's a pretty country, uh, and so on. So you, I've just described a whole trading network, and imagine it's all done with this cryptocurrency. So all we do is keep score. And you can keep score with baseball cards, bottle caps. I mean, it doesn't have to be money to keep score. It's just a way of keeping track. Peg two the SDR, the special drawing right, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, managed through a, a cryptocurrency system that's encrypted uh, and um, uh, secure. And then every now and then, once a month, once a quarter, once a year, we look at the chits and we decide who owes what to whom and we settle up in gold. And we put the gold on the plane, fly it over to the other guy, and there it is. Um, so this is a combination of a 21st cryptocurrency system with a 19th century or 5th century BC, if you like, gold system. You're combining the two, the oldest form of money and the newest form of money. 
Notice what's missing in everything I just described. No dollars. There's no dollar in that system. Uh, the SDR, the cryptocurrency, gold, the ledger, the trading network, all play a role, but there's no dollar in that system. That's what we're moving up towards. Um, this is a little technical. One of the gentlemen in the audience said, uh, I, I hope you talk about SDRs. And I thought to myself, be careful, be careful what you wish for, because uh, you may <laughs> we'll do a little bit of a deep dive. So the S SDR is not a uh, strawberry daiquiri on the rocks. It's a, uh, it's a special drawing right, which is a fancy name for world money. And they do this on purpose. It's IMF world money. Can you imagine if the IMF said, we print world money? They, people go burn the place down. But when they say we print special drawing rights, no one knows what they are, but it's, it's world money. Um, now, the value of an SDR, when I say value, I'm really talking about the price at which you could buy them or sell them, it used to be based on four currencies, dollars, euros, yen, and sterling. Those four currencies went into a formula, and everyone says they're backed by dollars, euros, yen, and sterling. No, they're not. They're not backed by anything. But you need to know what they're worth, so there was a formula for determining the value based on those four currencies. China wanted into that club. Remember I said the, the club dress code? China wanted to get into that club. Uh, it took them a long time, but finally on October 1st, 2016, China was admitted to that basket, so now the Chinese yuan is one of five currencies that are used to determine the, the value of the, um, the SDR. Now, what this chart shows, the dark blue line is the, on top is the dollar price of gold. And the lighter line at the bottom is the price of gold measured in SDRs. And notice that before October 1st, 2016, two things are true. Number one, there, there's volatility. It's trending up, but uh, there's a lot of volatility. And number two, there's a high correlation. The SDR line moves in pretty close correlation up and down with the dollar line. Look what happens beginning October 1st, 2016. The dollar price of gold continues to go up. It's gone down since this chart was made, but it's back up again in the last couple of days. It continues to go up with volatility following a trend line, but look at the SDR price of gold. It flatlines. It stays within a very narrow trading range, uh, and it's no longer correlated to the dollar price of gold. It's going its own way. The odds, statistically, the odds of this happening by coincidence are pretty close to zero. Things like this don't happen by coincidence. Uh, is it a fraud? No, because this is all publicly available information. Uh, the only third explanation for this is manipulation. Somebody's making this happen. Uh, and that is what is going on. That right at beginning October 1st, the value of gold is being pegged not to the dollar, but to the SDR. And this is uh, the, the thing on the left. This is, I didn't make this up. This is actually, if you go to the IMF website and say, what's, a, what's a SDR worth? This is what they give you. And the dollar is that in the red circle. It's a dollar point, you know, 401990. So call it dollar $1.40. Um, but that's what, uh, and here you can see the formula on the left, yuan, euro, yen, pound, dollar. This is their three-column formula sheet. And you say that SDR is worth a dollar forty and change. Um, is the IMF manipulating the SDR price of gold? No, certainly not. Uh, is, that, is anyone else doing it? Well, I'll come to this in a second, but the most likely suspect is, is China. But the way you do it, you don't have to go out and buy gold for SDRs. In fact, that would be fairly difficult to do. All you have to do is manipulate the dollar-euro exchange rate. By doing that, you change the dollar price of SDRs and all other, thing being, all other things being constant, if the SDR is stronger or weaker, that's going to change the SDR uh, price of gold. So you can manipulate it in the foreign exchange markets without ever trading an SDR, but you can do it in such a way that you peg the value of an ounce of gold to the SDR itself. Um, and I give an example. So this is July 13, 2018. Uh, the SDR dollar rate was $1.40 and change. Uh, the dollar price of gold was 1241. So what was the SDR price of gold? Well, all you do is you divide the, um, uh, the, the uh, dollar price of gold by the 140, and you get to uh, 885, uh, 170. So an ounce of gold was worth 885 SDRs. Now, below that, I say if you, move, if you manipulate the euro to a dollar, oops, sorry, manipulate the dollar to a dollar 18, that puts the dollar value of the SDR 
at $1.40.8, so a little bit higher than it was. And that moves yesterday our price to go up to 8.84. So I've, I've, by manipulating the dollar euro cross rate, I've moved the SDR price of gold from 8.85 to 8.84, which means the SDR got stronger and gold got a little bit cheaper. But this is how you do it. This is how you can do it. Um, why? Uh, and it's centered on 900. If you go back uh, two slides, uh, the center of that trend line is 900 SDRs per ounce of gold. That's the peg. Uh, well, why 900? Well, it turns out that the total amount of SDRs issued by the IMF is 204 billion, 204 billion SDRs. The total gold held by the IMF is 2,814 metric tons. It's equivalent to about 90 million ounces. So take the SDRs, 204 billion, divided by 90 million ounces, and you get to an SDR price of 2,255 SDRs per ounce. That's what you would have to have if you had 100% backing. But no gold standard uh, has ever had 100% backing. The US, even under the gold standard from 1913 to 1945, we only used 40% backing. So taking 40% of 2,255 SDRs, you get to 902.1, bingo. So there's your 900. So basically, the price of gold is being pegged at 900 SDRs per ounce with which gives the IMF a 40% gold backing for the peg. Um, who's doing this? Well, there are only four entities on the planet that could pull this off. Uh, the US Treasury, uh, the European Central Bank, uh, China's sovereign wealth fund called the State Administration on Foreign Exchange. Notice I did not say the People's Bank of China. This is not a central bank operation. The, the, the financial center of China is not the central bank. It's safe. They have more money, more hidden gold, more currencies. Um, they control whatever China does in global markets. The, the People's Bank of China is kind of just there for show. And then the IMF itself. Um, we can eliminate the Treasury and the ECB. They show no uh, evidence of transactions in gold or SDRs. It's actually fairly transparent. Uh, IMF has not sold any gold since 2010. Uh, so through a process of elimination, I settle on safe, it's non-transparent, led by experts, has ample reserves of dollars, gold, SDRs, and euros, and they're perfectly capable of pulling this off. So uh, this is inferential, this is uh, what we call the inferential method in intelligence. I can't, I didn't break into any safe in Beijing, I can't wave a document that proves this, but getting all the facts available and using inference, this would be my conclusion. Uh, so just to wrap up the end game, the end game is the demise of the US dollar as the benchmark global reserve currency. Only by doing that can all of our adversaries get out from under the dollar sanctions, the dollar penalties, the dollar tariffs, all the things the US uses to throw its weight around in the financial world. You need a different system. As long as you're in a dollar system, you're not getting out from under US sanctions. The US could do some smart things, maybe use the sanctions with a little bit lighter touch, uh, maybe the U.S. should buy some gold itself. I've recommended that a number of times. It doesn't get very far. By the way, I'll be in Washington on Friday morning for a uh, closed-door um, discussion, and the topic is de-dollarization. So <coughs> I do think that the U.S. government is finally waking up to this, but uh, we'll see what they say on Friday. Um, but basically, uh, Russia and China are building alternate payment systems. The IMF is promoting world money. Uh, a new back, gold-backed currency uh, or SDR currency or some combination is possible. And I uh, just make the point that no world power in history has survived without a dominant currency. You don't have global power and a cheap currency. The two go hand in hand. So the U.S. better think as hard about the dollar as we do about our aircraft carriers and our ballistic missiles and our drones and our satellites and, and everything else. Um, uh, we're heading up to World War III. Uh, unfortunately, that may be the case. Uh, things seem to have calmed down between U.S. and North Korea. That's good. But if they hot up again, um, this will any war there would involve uh, Japan, Russia, and China, as well as the United States and North Korea. So that's a good proxy for World War III. This is why the U.S. is trying to improve relations with Russia. As I mentioned before, Putin and Trump are the two most powerful nationalists in the world. Notice I say nationalist, not globalist. When you look at uh, Emmanuel Macron or uh, Pierre uh, or Justin Trudeau or uh, uh, Angela Merkel, they're all globalists. Uh, but Trump and Putin are hardcore nationalists. It doesn't mean you can't get along. It doesn't mean you can't negotiate. But it's America first or Russia first, as the case may be. 
Um, so uh, additional resources here are, are the four books I've written. Uh, they have nice cheery titles like uh, The Death of Money, The Road to Ruin, uh, Currency Wars. Um, I wrote a, a the, the three to your left are, or to the right, sorry, are volumes one, two, and three of a four volume quartet I'm writing on the international monetary system. Volume four will come out next year. It's going to be called Aftermath. Uh, I've got it right here on this flash drive and I'm almost done writing it, but it'll be out in, in four or five months. Uh, the new case for gold is a little bit of a manifesto just on gold because I realized in presentations like this, um, people don't understand gold. They have wedding rings and some jewelry, but they're like, what's it got to do with money? And I thought, uh, and, and the things they do understand are mostly incorrect. Uh, so I thought if I could clear up the confusion, make the case, and just let people do their own thing, that that would be helpful. So I, I thank you very much and look forward to any questions. Well, I'll give you a hybrid answer. The, the number one uh, digital cryptocurrency in the world is the U.S. dollar. Um, people, you might have a couple bucks in your, in your purse or your wallet, but how do you deal with dollars? Well, you probably have direct deposit to your banking account, you pay your bills online, you have credit cards, you have debit cards. 95, I dare say 95% or more of what you do in dollars is all digital. And all those transactions are encrypted. So the dollar is a digital cryptocurrency. Uh, what's different about blockchain, and I think this is uh, uh, where you're leading with the question, is who keeps the books? Well, with the, with the dollar, we know who keeps the books. Your bank, your broker, the US Treasury. There are one or more central institutions that keep the books and determine what you have or don't have. With, um, with what's called a distributed ledger, there's no one place that keeps the books. The message traffic and the, and the verification, the validation is spread among thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of computers all over the world. And if you start taking them out one by one, shooting drones at them, whatever, it doesn't matter because it's on some computer someplace else. And the theory of Bitcoin was that it was a trustless system. You didn't have to trust anybody. Right now, you have to trust your bank. You have to trust your broker. You have to trust the US Treasury. With a distributed ledger, you don't have to trust anybody. It's just out there, it's encrypted, and you can move it around. Now, that's the theory. The reality is completely different. Um, number one, depending on, uh, first of all, not all, I mentioned earlier, there are 2,000 cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin is the largest. It's 51% of the market capitalization of the total cryptocurrency market. Um, it's probably the worst. Because uh, it was the first, you know, you don't really know what you're doing. I always say that the people behind cryptocurrencies are brilliant engineers and applied mathematicians and developers. They don't know anything about monetary economics. Because if you did, you wouldn't design them this way. But um, Bitcoin, for example, is is currently using as much electricity to mine the Bitcoin, create the brick, the Bitcoin as the country of Nigeria. In a few years, they'll be using as much electricity as the country of Japan. Uh, does anybody think that they're going to be allowed to do that? Does anybody think that the G20, the United Nations, the IMF, the climate change people, that they're going to let Bitcoin miners use as much electricity as Japan to mine Bitcoins for what? Uh, so it, that's, it's non-sustainable. It's not going anywhere. Um, it's non-scalable. Uh, everyone's like, you can buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin. Well, that's true in about like six places in the whole world. But when you do, your $4 cup of coffee has a $25 transaction fee. That's how much it costs to move the Bitcoin through the system. So that doesn't sound too attractive. Um, the, the hacking, the, the, the theft. Uh, who got rich off of Bitcoin? Well, actually, I, some friends of mine took $1,000, 
they bought a thousand Bitcoin when they were a dollar a piece and they sold them at fifteen thousand dollars and they walked away with fifteen million dollars and they even paid their taxes which is more than most of these people do so so my friends got like whatever twelve thirteen million dollars out of it it's real money and they, those stories are true there are Bitcoin millionaires and Bitcoin billionaires out there but what they don't tell you is that every penny of profit came out of somebody's pocket there was a homeowner who took out a home equity loan to bet the ranch on Bitcoin. There was a South Korean auto shop operator who hocked his inventory so he could buy Bitcoin. And these are the people who were buying the Bitcoin at fifteen, seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars a coin when I was on television screaming at them, don't do it. Uh, it's, it's a bubble, it's going to crash, and it did. Um, see, Bill Gates is worth, I don't know, seventy billion dollars or something like that. I'm fine with that. Bill Gates earned every penny. He created more value than he took. He took $70 billion of value out of the system, but he's created trillions of dollars of value for all the people who use his software and all the industries and all the applications and all that. So that's how America works. You can get rich, that's okay, as long as you create value, more value than you, you took. That's not true in Bitcoin. Everybody who profited in Bitcoin took it out of somebody else's pocket. There's no value creation. It's just like gambling. Um, it's, it's worse than that, actually, because you know, free drinks. So um, the, the, the point being, everything about Bitcoin is, is deficient, and it's probably going to go down to $200 as a residual token for terrorists and criminals. There are other cryptocurrencies out there that might have a future. I think the blockchain distributed ledger technology has a future. It's good technology. And some of these tokens are being used in conjunction with uh, IBM and uh, some of the big banks and uh, other development institutions, they have much more sustainable models. But you have to be an expert. I mean, you can't just go to the, uh, you know, the Bitcoin uh, the, or the crypto exchange and start betting your hard-earned money. You ha actually have to read these white papers and understand banking, understand finance, drill down and figure out which ones might have a future or, or might not. Um, so that's sort of my overview of crypto land. Uh, but if it ever does succeed, the central banks are going to shut it down <laughs> because they don't want the competition. So, as I say, you might, see, you might see Russia and China come up with their own cryptocurrency. In fact, they already are. But that will be controlled by governments, not cowboys. Thank you very much. James, if and when the U.S. dollar loses its currency, will the dollar be placed in the world? Do you see the SDRs or uh, gold? What would you look to diversify in to cover your empty spot? And a follow-up question would leap, since I've read some of the materials, if we do, in fact, have a $10,000 gold price, would a leap, or a lateral leap, be a good way, long-term uh, option place, would they be a good way to try and capture it also? Well, um, the key word you mentioned was diversification. Uh, that that no one knows exactly what's going to happen. I can outline scenarios. I can tell you which ones I think are more likely than not. But, uh, uh, and you can also have some catastrophic scenarios where just everyone loses a lot of wealth and there's, there's sort of no place to hide. But um, I recommend a 10% allocation to gold. Everyone thinks, you know, people like to put words in your mouth. Like Jim Rickards says, sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. I don't believe the apocalypse is uh, right around the corner. I do recommend a 10% allocation of investable assets to gold, and then that leaves 90%, and I have a big slug of cash, I think, you know, 30% cash is okay. Everyone's like, it has no yield. It's like, yeah, but it reduces the volatility in the rest of your portfolio, it won't go away, and when things do collapse, you're the one with a fat wallet who can go out and pick up bargains. And by the way, the guy who does that best is Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett has $115 billion in cash, the most cash they've ever had in um, uh, Berkshire Hathaway. So he sees this coming as well. Uh, and then beyond that, yeah, you want to buy stocks, uh, go for it. Uh, I, don't, uh, I, I don't personally own any listed equities, but um, there's a place for them in portfolio. I like, uh, I like private equity. I like uh, venture capital. I own um, privately I own a, a technology company, a natural resource company. I like land. Um, it's always going to be there. You know, it's cliche, but it's true. Uh, I, don't give in, I don't give individual investment advice, so I'm not going to talk about particular strategies, but um, to me, a lot of people have, they've got 100 stocks in their portfolio. They're 90% in stocks, and they go, well, I'm diversified because I've got 100 stocks. No, you're not. 
stocks have been commoditized. They trade, you know, it's risk on, risk off. Uh, they all go up together, they all go down together. You could have 100 stocks, but the way I think about it, you have one asset class, stocks. And you say, well, I got tech, I got uh, consumer non-durables, I got uh, semiconductors. They'll all go down together. And so that's not a diversified portfolio, in my view. A diversified portfolio is, I got a slice of stocks, but I also have some land, some cash, some gold, maybe some fine art. I'm not talking about college dorm posters. I'm talking about you know, things that maybe could hang in a museum. Um, private equity, venture capital, that's a diversified portfolio. Those asset categories have very little correlation, relatively low correlation with each other. The slug of cash is important because people always say to me, well, whenever there's a market crash, gold goes down. Well, that's actually true for a short period of time. And you saw this in the fall of 2008, gold went down. Well, people say, well, gold's supposed to be the safe haven. Gold's supposed to be the thing everyone's running to. Why does it go down in a market panic? And the answer is because it's liquid, meaning when you're in distress, you don't sell what you want, you sell what you can. In 2008, everybody wanted to sell mortgages, but they couldn't, there was no bid, nobody wanted the mortgages but they could sell the gold. They were selling the gold to get the cash to meet the margin calls on the collapse of the mortgage market. So you were selling the gold to get your hands on cash. But that doesn't last long. It lasts for a month or two months or whatever. And at that point, the strong hands come out. Like, okay, gold got knocked down. That's what I really want. And everyone that was in liquidation mode sold it. So now I'll start buying some gold. Uh, and then gold did very well from 2008 to 2011. It was one of the great bull markets in gold. So uh, the point being, uh, you, want, you want gold for a slice. So I don't have anything against equities, but you know, people say if you have gold in your portfolio, how can you sleep at night? And I say, if you have 90% equities, how can you sleep at night? Um, very good question. So one place they're not getting it, uh, at least today, are other central banks or countries. Now, up until 2010, um, it's funny, the last time the United States sold gold in any, any significant size was um, 1980. We haven't sold any gold in, uh, in uh, 40, uh, over 40 years, uh, or almost 40 years. Um, in 1950, the United States had 20,000 tons of gold. In 1970, we had 9,000 tons. So you say, where did the 11,000 tons go? Well, it went to our trading partners, because in those days, if you had dollars, you could cash them in for gold, and they did. So Germany had 3,000 tons, Italy had 2,000 tons, France had 2,000 tons, J you know, Japan had 600 tons, and so forth. That's where the gold went. But the problem is there was a run on the bank. People were losing confidence in the dollar, they were cashing in their dollars as fast as they could, uh, and the gold kept going down. And that's when uh, Richard Nixon closed the gold window, August 15th, 1971. He said, no more gold. He said, if you earn dollars, you know, knock yourself out. Come buy a Rockefeller Center, buy a farm or whatever, but no more gold. So the U.S. gold supply has been constant at about 8,000 tons. We sold a little bit more in the second half of the 70s, but we, we hit a bottom of about 8,000 tons and stayed there since 1980. But we twisted everyone else's arm when people wanted gold. So we got the UK to sell two thirds of their gold in the late 90s. We got the Swiss to sell 1,000 tons of gold in the early 2000s. We got the IMF to sell 400 tons of gold in 2010. So we were getting everyone else to sell their gold. We never sold any of ours. Um, and then they just stopped. No central banks have sold any gold since uh, 2010. Uh, so they're getting it from private hands. They're getting it from gold miners but that's in short supply. Uh, I talked to uh, the head of uh, Secure Logistics at the biggest gold vault in Switzerland, um, and he, he was kind of laughing. He said, we're get, so we're getting gold in so fast that we're running out of space and we're negotiating with the Swiss Army to buy these hollowed out mountains in the Alps with quadruple security perimeters to use those as our vaults. Um, and uh, I said, where's the gold coming from? And he said, it's coming from the banks, meaning the same owner 
but the owner is taking it out of UBS and Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse and moving it to Viamat and Loomis and Brinks and some of the private non-bank vaults. So that's one course. Uh, and he said, you know, when you fill up these vaults, uh, all of the bars, uh, the, the good delivery bars, have a date stamped on them. It's just like a dollar bill. It's got weight and purity and uh, assayer and uh, refinery and, and a date. And he said, we're starting to see bars like from the 1970s, which means the vaults are being cleaned out. Because you, you, know, you put the first ones in and then you pile it up. So, so I get a 2006 bar, I know that's reasonable. When I start seeing bars from the 1980s, I know the vaults are being cleaned out because they, they're going to the back of the vault, what's left of it to, to bring this gold over here. So, uh, so the, the fundamental supply demand situation for gold is extremely favorable. Uh, there's rising demand from the countries I mentioned. Uh, the gold mining supply is flat. It's about 2,000 tons a year, but they're not, there's no like California gold rush going on. They haven't found any major deposits that would increase that to 3,000 tons a year. And so the only other source for gold uh, are private holdings. Uh, and then uh, at what point do people say, no, I think I'll hang on to it. So um, it's a very tight supply demand situation. Gold is manipulated through futures markets, uh, paper markets, uh, uh, London Bullion Market Association. A lot of people think they own gold. They, they call J.P. Morgan and say, I want to buy, you know, a thousand pounds of gold or whatever. And J.P. Morgan says, okay, you're done. And they send you the paperwork and you sign it. I got the gold at J.P. Morgan. If you actually read that paperwork, and I, I have, I'm enough of a geek that I, I read all of it. Uh, it's what they call unallocated gold, which means they could take one bar of gold and sell it to everybody in the room and tell everybody they have a bar of gold. And what they hope is that you don't all show up at once for your gold. If, if one person shows up, you get the bar, and they go out and buy another bar and replace it, uh, but they hope you don't all show up. Well, what happens if you do? They're going to terminate the agreements. You're going to get a notice saying your agreement was terminated as of the close of business yesterday. They won't steal your money. They'll give you a check for yesterday's closing price, and you'll go, but wait a second. I want, today's, I want tomorrow's price. That's why I bought the gold. Like, too bad. It's over. So. Um, uh, so a lot of people think they have gold, don't actually have it. I recommend physical bullion. I recommend keeping it non-bank storage. Check your vault operator, make sure they're insured, make sure they have references, make sure they've been around a long time, et cetera. Um, American Gold Eagles are fine. Uh, uh, one kilo bars are kind of the new world standard. Four nines, 99.99% pure. Um, don't, don't spend money on numismatics. Most of the online dealers, there's some honest ones, but not that many. Most of them are, they're not frauds, but they're there to rip people off, you know, so you just want to buy a new American Gold Eagle, and next thing you know, they're selling you a 1933 Morgan Gold dollar, but the markup is 200%. Is there any value in that? No, it's just gold. So, uh, so I buy new ones because there's no numismatic value. I, mean, I have a couple of Roman Empire coins, but that's different. Great, great talk. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, couple of comments along with what you were talking about earlier. Uh, in 1965, 1966, and 7, our Air Force was flying over Vietnam. We were buying gold at $35 an ounce. And many people were buying gold food grains, or the equivalent in the blockchain or wherever it was. It was, it was a, a good buy for that time. And uh, that came here in the 60s and 70s. And I came to Chapel Hill in 1979. 1978, bought my house in 1979 at a 10.5% interest rate. And of course, now we've seen gold at 1,200 some odd dollars, interest rates at 5%. Uh, things go up and they go down. So it's just a little bit of what you said. Be careful. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both on gold. Does it Yes. Okay. And I'm, I'm understanding that the physical possession of the gold would also say that would be better than um, investing in gold mining stocks or um, silver or gold ETFs where you don't actually hold it. Yeah, I would distinguish between ETFs and gold mining stocks for this reason. ETF is just a way to own gold, except it's not gold. It's a share of stock on the New York Stock Exchange in a trust that owns the gold in London, and there are leads and lags between when you buy the share and when they get the gold, and 
They can close the stock exchange. They can close the ETF. So I don't like that at all as a form of gold. Gold miners are different for the following reason. Um, the, the economics of gold mining are such that you have fixed costs and, and floating costs uh, or variable costs. And when the gold price goes up, the fixed costs don't necessarily go up. Uh, if you bought some equipment, it's the same equipment. If you bought the land, it's the same land. Uh, you know, your wages might go up, et cetera. So all of that excess profit drops to the bottom line. So you get a multiplier effect. And then stocks are typically valued at a multiple of earnings or cash flow, depending on what method you want to use. So if gold goes up 20%, gold miners might go up 50% or 60%. Now, the same is true in the opposite direction. Gold goes down, the miners can go down more. But gold miners are a more volatile form of owning gold. And so it depends what you like. But I would say there is a, there is a case for owning gold mining stocks if you want a little more you know, leverage behind your investment. I, I think so, but that's, that's just my opinion. I base that on a couple of things. Putting aside the SDR stuff, if you go to gold in dollars, uh, for three months, actually until two days ago, so uh, this might prove my point, but um, it was trading in a very narrow band between 11.85 and 12.15. Uh, that's a $30 band centered around $1,200, so it was a 2.5% band, which is pretty skinny. And uh, the last time gold traded that narrowly, traded sideways for that long, was December 2015. And when it broke out, it went ballistic. It went from uh, $1,050 an ounce to $1,360 an ounce in six months. That was around the time of Brexit in the summer of 2016. Um, could it go down? Sure. But I think given the fundamentals I described earlier with supply and demand, with the Russians and the Chinese and everyone else buying it, the miners not being able to produce more, the vaults getting empty. It seemed to me that there's a very strong floor, and if it's in an hour trading range, it's going to break out, it's going to break out to the upside. So I do think it's a good entry point. Are you okay with two more? I thought Mary was the last one, so we have two more that's joined the, but we'll need to keep it. I can do two more, sure. Well, I don't really pay any attention to the silver-gold ratio, uh, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about it because going back in history, people say, well, you know, the, there was a silver-gold ratio of 16 to 1, <coughs> and so if it's 85 to 1, which it is, I mean, mathematically, uh, silver must be dirt cheap. Well, first of all, the 16 to 1 was never a market ratio. There's nothing in the chemistry, the geology, the mining output, supply and demand that says silver gold should be 16 to 1. That was the result of the Western silver mining interests lobbying the Congress and paying off the Congress around 1900 to help demand for silver. Uh, remember President McKinley was, the, he was the, you know, the lion in the Wizard of Oz. He was, uh, he was the, uh, the, the um, sorry, he was the, the wizard in the Wizard of Oz, uh, which for those who don't know is, a, is an extended satire uh, or allegory of the gold standard. Oz is ounce, O-Z. So, um, but McKinley was a gold advocate and didn't really care about silver and those silver mining interests were suffering. So they lobbied the Congress, they got a 16 to one ratio. So that's where it comes from, but it was nothing more than a successful lobbying campaign. It has nothing to do with economics. Now today, you say the ratio is 85 to one and it is, does that mean silver is gonna go up? Maybe, uh, or maybe not, or maybe gold's gonna come down. So I, and silver is more difficult to analyze because it actually has industrial uses. The thing I love about gold, it's not good for anything except money. It's, it's the best form of money. It's not good for anything else. You can't, I mean, it, it, they coat space helmets and there's some special wiring applications and a few things, but it's a very small percentage of the total market. So, um, so that makes it very easy to analyze as money. When you get over to silver, is it a precious metal? Is it a form of money? Yes but it's also an industrial input. So it'll go up or down based on the economy and demand for automobiles and demand for other 
applications that use silver. So it's, it's not a pure case. So two, two things. I don't put much weight on the ratio. It is what it is. Uh, it's hard to analyze silver because it has industrial applications. Having said that, there's no way that gold's going to $10,000 an ounce and silver's not going to $100 an ounce. I mean, silver's, silver's along for the ride. If gold, if, if gold soars, which I expect, s silver's going to go up. It's not going to sit there where it is now. But I wouldn't hang too much weight on a ratio. Last question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll do the second part first. There, the countries that are richest in gold are Russia, China temporar temporarily, although they're, they're stripping their mines pretty fast, Canada, Australia. Now Canada's official gold reserves are zero. They actually, I have more gold than Canada uh, in, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of official gold. Now, but Canada's attitude was, well, we have a lot of gold in the ground, so if we really need it, we'll just go dig it up. Well, that's fine, but I spend a lot of time with miners. It, it takes time. Uh, it's, not as, it's easier said than done. It costs money to dig up the gold. I mean, why aren't they digging up all the gold now if it didn't cost about $1,200 an ounce? Um, so I'm not sure what that gets you. But yeah, that's a resource. It's like oil. Uh, uh, it's like having a fertile land. Uh, it's like having hydroelectric power. It's, it's definitely a resource in those countries. But because of the lag and the expense between getting gold out of the ground and refining it into bullion, that's, that's easier, it's doable, but it's easier said than done. In a monetary crisis, it's the people with the gold in the vaults who are going to have, think of it as a pile of poker chips and you sit down at the poker table, they're going to be the players. Um, and so I would look at the gold you have now to figure out if there's a crisis in the near term. And if I didn't have enough gold, I'd start acquiring it. So I had. Uh, a bigger pile of chips when, when the time comes. As far as the cashless society is concerned, we're pretty much there. I think the government won the war on cash. Um, it was interesting to read about North Carolina from the, 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 uh, you know, the distance of uh, New England, because you guys just went through two hurricanes. I know they hit elsewhere, but you got a good soaking, and uh, uh, it was a little worse than that. And, uh, but I know a lot of people were lining up for gas, but they were also lining up at the ATMs to get money, at least as much as you could. By the way, if you have money in the bank, it's not your money. It's the bank's money. They'll give it to you if they feel like it. Like try getting $5,000 out of an ATM, you can't do it. Try getting $5,000 from a teller without them filing a suspicious activity report with the treasury. So you think it's your money, but it really isn't. Um, but, uh, but that said, uh, we're pretty far along to a cashless society. Um, Governments have two reasons for doing that. One is they might want to impose negative interest rates. So if you have $100,000 in the bank and they put on a 1% negative interest rate, after a year you'll have $99,000. They'll take $1,000 out of your bank account. It's the opposite of paying interest. Uh, the, other, the other reason is um, if they want to freeze it, uh, they can do so. Because the way, the way to get around negative interest rates is to take all your money out of the bank and just bury it in the backyard. Well, if it's completely digital, you can't do that. Uh, and then in a panic, if they want to freeze your account, they can do that easily when it's in digital form. So those are the motivations for it. Um, there's a simple antidote, which is just get some gold and silver coins. James okay. Rickards, thank